Hi everyone, I'm Soyel Filias, the Programs Learning and Development Specialist at SAREC. And on behalf of SAREC and our partner LMIC, I would like to welcome you back to our Labor Market Information Webinar Series. Today is the third and final webinar of this series. And to close it, I'm pleased to have two wonderful presenters with us today. Anthony Mancioni, Director of Research at LMIC, and Graham Dobbs, economist at LMIC as well. Anthony and Graham will walk you through the LMIC's updated online job trends dashboard and will discuss how job posting data can help you support your clients. But before starting, I would like to acknowledge the lens from where we are learning today. So I would like to invite you to consider the indigenous connection past and present to the lens where you are living or working. I would like to acknowledge that for me and the Sarek teams, the Aranwanda, Petun, Rodney Shoni, Anishinabe, and Mississauga Anishinabe of New Credit share a special relationship to the territory in which my home and our office are located in Toronto. So we are grateful to have this opportunity to learn together on this lens today. Now, just uh, a few reminders you must know by now, but you can interact with uh, Anthony and Graham and ask your question or share comments at any time by using the question function you see on your screen. We'll have a Q&A session where our presenter will address all of your questions at the end of uh, today's webinar. And please note, we will send you the recording of today's webinar along with the presentation slide later today. And finally, as I said, today is the last webinar of this series. So you will have a pop-up survey at the end of the webinar. Uh, please take just a few minutes to let us know what you thought of the series, but also what your future learning needs are on the webinar format. So we will we'll, uh, greatly value your, your feedback. So thank you in advance for, for your comments. Uh, but for now, we are thrilled to have Anthony and Graham share their knowledge and expertise with us today. So without any further ado, let me turn it over to our presenter. So over to you, Graham. Uh, th thanks, Eliette. I'm actually going to get started. So hi, everyone. I hope you're having a fantastic Monday. I'm Anthony. Um, as Cyril said, I'm the Acting Director of Research at the Labor Market Information Council, or LMIC for short. And I'm joined today by my colleague uh, and economist, Graham. And it's, it's really a pleasure to have this opportunity to speak to you today about a new product uh, that we've been working very hard on, one that we think will help you to find and, and to use um, information about the changing world of work with your clients. Now, I know that many of you are already familiar with LMIC and what we do, but in case we have some people new tuning in. I just want to give you a very quick overview of our organization. We uh, started operations in 2018 with a mission uh, to empower Canadians to make more informed career, education, and hiring decisions. Um, and we do that by improving the availability and reducing barriers to relevant labor market information, or LMI. And since we've started, we've been working with a lot of different stakeholders from our federal, provincial, and territorial government partners to institutional researchers and career development professionals, uh, like many of you joining us today, with the goal specifically of understanding what needs exist when it comes to the data and the information that will help facilitate better decision making. So it's for this reason that we're gathered today. And as it was said, to share with you specifically a new product that LMIC has created to address this need as it relates to better information on the skills and other work requirements of jobs. Great. Um, so uh, as you may know, my name is Graham and I'll be running the, some of the session today. Um, I'll just go over a quick outline of what we're going to be talking about specifically related to our new product called the Canadian Job Trends Dashboard. Um, we'll start with a bit of the motivation um, to get um, any of you up to speed and hear why we created this dashboard. We'll talk about some of the definitions and concepts you might see in the dashboard and, and give you kind of a better understanding of, of how these definitions and concepts might relate um, to the actual you know, real-time data we put into the dashboard. And then I will um, go through a bit of an overview of the Canadian job trends and skills, 
um, through our dashboard and then have some final closing remarks and uh, hopefully a little bit of chats with us. So, um, I just want to do a kind of a quick mental uh, exercise to get everyone involved and thinking about some questions and ideas surrounding uh, your responsibilities and what you might get out of this presenta presentation. So, you know, you're a seasoned career guidance practitioner and a client walks into your office. It's clear to you that they are here to seek your assistance in finding out what skills and occupations are in demand. While you have a clear outlook on the job market yourself, you might want to express this insight in a way that is backed by data and easy enough to understand. So uh, you may have a labor market uh, information or what we like to call LMI point person in the office, or you might be that person yourself. So how do you respond to them? Um, what is your normal process? Uh, is the information you have up to date? Does it pertain to the particular region you might work in? And uh, do you have every occupation or job you might want? And how do you know, you know what skills and technology this particular um, occupation may need? And last is, have I asked you know, really too many questions for you yet? But uh, we'll, we'll continue on anyways. Yeah, so I think, that, I think that's a good place to start. So I'm not sure if you asked too many questions, but I definitely think that you've asked some very important ones and ones hopefully that are likely to resonate uh, with the people listening today. As labor economists, we get asked a lot of questions about what jobs uh, are in demand, what skills are in demand. And we're sometimes hesitant to answer this question because unfortunately, the answer is not very straightforward. Uh, and this is for really a lot of different conceptual reasons, right? So take the term in demand, for example. It has a very specific meaning in economics, which may differ from the way it's, it's talked about in everyday speech. And that's true of a lot of the different terms. So the goal of this slide is really just to start with a quick review of what we mean by some of these concepts to make sure that everyone is on the same page and starting from the same place um, to build the understanding of the use of this tool. So the first thing that I want to do is just clarify the difference between a job vacancy and a job posting, right? So a job vacancy is an unfilled position in an organization for which the employer is actively recruiting. So this actively recruiting part is important because job vacancies are counted by Statistics Canada using the job vacancy wage survey. And in order to be counted as a vacancy, the position has to be vacant within the same month of the survey. And the employer has to be actively seeking outside of the organization to fill a job. But we know that an online job posting has no such requirement, right? So I'm sure we all know, for example, of ghost jobs uh, online or advertisements that an employer isn't actually hiring for, but maybe just using to collect resumes, as well as other, other examples. Um, even employers don't post online if they're hiring, right? They might rely on word of mouth, for example. The point is that while online job postings can offer a lot of information about the jobs that employers are looking for, and then by extension, give us some insight into the demand for certain jobs and skills, they're not official job vacancies. The second concept that's important to clarify is the definition of an occupation. In everyday speech, we typically interchange occupation with the job, but for statistical reporting and data collection, they're not the same. Right, So we know that an occupation rather is a collection of similar jobs that are grouped under a, a common label, whereas a job itself is defined as a set of tasks performed by a single worker. So a good example here um, under our national occupation classification system, the NOC system, that I imagine many of you are familiar with, would be a hemodialysis nurse, an infection control officer, and a home healthcare nurse, right? These are three jobs that are all classified under the same occupation of registered nurses. And the last concept that I want to just clarify is what we mean by a skill. So this one is probably the most controversial because there are many different definitions for what a skill is based on the source, the discipline. But for our purposes, we go with the uh, ESDC's definition of skills, which defines them as developed capacities that an individual has to be um, has to have in order to be effective in a job, a role, function, task, or duty. In this way, a skill is, dis is different from an ability, from knowledge, and a tool and technology that's used uh, in the workplace. 
In the world of job postings, we could collectively refer to all of these things, so skills, abilities, knowledge, tools, as work requirements. So kind of the last final concept uh, we want to discuss before jumping into it um, is looking at what we define as in-demand. So typically, um, you know, in economics, we would consider something a job that is in demand by seeing an increase uh, in the demand for certain skills and occupations. But uh, theoretically, we'd see the increase in the number of people who are employed in this particular occupation, as well as the amount of vacancies uh, that exist in the occupation uh, at the current point in time. So in reality, um, Canadian job trends and skills, uh, our dashboard, is just a proxy for vacancies uh, in occupations and skills. Um, so to, to think about it a little um, more clearly, and during COVID-19, we can think of, you know, what certain occupations may have seen an increase in demand. Well, you know, nurses may see an increase in demand because uh, of the amount of strain you'd see on the healthcare system. Um, web designers and developers might see more demand because um, physical shops uh, need to find a digital marketplace for their goods. So that's just a couple examples, but you know, I'm sure there's a lot more you can think of. Um, so we'll move on to the next, uh, next slide. So here is uh, kind of the, just a couple of screenshots of, of our Canadian Job Trends dashboard. Um, so to try and recap it very um, concisely, uh, it's an interactive dashboard um, that allows you to look up the number of job postings in nearly real time uh, by geographic region, by occupation, uh, as well as by, by work requirement. So these, job, these online job postings are actually collected and cleaned uh, by our data partner to identify the work requirements detailed by employers in the job postings, which includes the skills, their knowledge domains, their tools and technologies. This data has been collected and updated monthly since uh, January 2018. So each month, this data is collected from thousands of websites and job boards across Canada. Um, then we also then they then they identify the new and new unique job postings. So this is to say that there's not very much, if if any, double counting within the job postings that are in this data. So it allows users to explore timely, granular labor market information related to online job postings in an aggregated way. Um, with any, any time period from January 2018, um, a user can explore the type and frequency of work requirements uh, and occupations. So we collect, as, as I've already said, we collect a number of uh, job postings found on various websites and job boards, and then link these to the unique occupation and set of work requirements. These work requirements, which there are almost over 40,000 possible, only about 2,500 of them appear regularly in job, post, in job postings. But we categorize this to the taxonomy, which is based on the skills and competencies taxonomy from uh, Employment and Social Development Canada. Canada. We categorize them into four um, different domains, which is skills, knowledge, tools and technology, and other. Um, there are actually seven um, skills and competencies, but uh, we have collapsed all the interests, personal abilities and attributes, work activities and work context into the other group. So this near real-time information on jobs and their work requirements uh, can be detailed all the way to the um, five-digit career handbook uh, occupation classification, as well as be rolled up into more aggregated uh, occupational groups. Uh, by, by month, year, quarter, and, and job location. Um, so in terms of regions, we have 78 sub-provincial or sub-territorial locations are available, which are based on Statistics Canada's economic regions. So I'm gonna break down some of the things you can do with the dashboard, looking at just kind of some in-demand skills, and uh, occupations by the 10 major uh, occupation groups in great detail. Uh, please listen very closely. Okay, Graham, I'm gonna stop you there for a second. Um, that sounds nice, but what can I actually do with this dashboard? 
So let me give you let me give you a scenario here, right? Let's say I am a high school student. Uh, I'm in Toronto. Um, I love mathematics, right? Math is my favorite subject. I also like visual arts. I've taken maybe a few coding classes that I really enjoyed. What can this dashboard do for me? So that's a great question, Anthony. Um, so say, like you said, you're a high school student. Uh, you're interested in in you know design. It seems like something in in type sort of an engineering or software engineering type role. Um, we actually have the ability to look up uh, skills and tools that someone would enjoy working in these occupations, like programming, web design, and engineering. As I've said, uh, at this very moment. So I've actually pulled up our dashboard here. Um, and as you can see, I've selected the work requirements for natural and applied sciences related occupations. And it looks like in terms of tools and technology, uh, structured query language uh, appears in about 14% of all these job postings across Canada, uh, as well as cloud computing, uh, Microsoft Excel and Office, Java and Python. Java and, Python. Um, and this is just in the last three months. So this is a very recent look at you know, what's, what kind of jobs, um, what skills are needed within these jobs. Let's say if I wanted to get kind of a deeper look. So if I want to look at um, you know, skills and, and tools in say something like software engineer, I'm just gonna click to my next tab um, and look at some of the uh, work requirements that are demand for software engineers in the last three months. So here we have tools and technology like Java, uh, skills like teamwork, uh, tools like cloud computing that appear in almost half of the job postings. So it gives me a very clear and recent look into what work requirements I would find for someone who would want to be a software engineer. Um, and say I want to see, you know, I'm really interested in the job, but I don't really know uh, if, if there's a lot of jobs that are available uh, in the last, uh, let's say, year for, for software engineering. So um, unfortunately, this uh, visualizations feature is not live on our website, but it will be in the coming month. Um, but I'll just click on it here to show our beta version. And so um, basically what this uh, visualization is showing me is the number of software engineer and designer jobs uh, across Canada from April 2020 to March 2022. Um, and as you can see here, um, there's, a, there's a pretty kind of uh, significant increase um, over this period uh, for the amount of vacancies for software engineers and designers. And like we said, we don't know if this is, you know, you know in demand per se, but we know there's a lot of vacancies uh, for this occupation um, over the same time period. Does that answer that's, your question? Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, but let me, let me ask you this now. What if I had a degree um, and I wanted to be a policy researcher, but I didn't know uh, where the most postings were located, right? So I'm trying to think now, maybe do I need to move? Do I need to relocate someplace else across Canada? Uh, and then and what skills do I need to put on my resume, right? Because I, I know that uh, it's important when I'm applying for a job to highlight the job tasks and skills that are reflected in the posting. So is that something that this dashboard can help me do? That's a great question, Anthony. It's like uh, you're reading my mind. So to answer your first question, um, our job trends dashboard can actually compare across a number of different dimensions, including region. So here I've used the comparison tool to look at policy researcher jobs uh, across some researchers that are probably pretty likely to be hiring a policy researcher. So that would be Toronto, Ottawa, and Montreal. So this is, um, the, as you can see here, the blue line represents uh, all job postings for policy and program researchers. Uh, from January 2021 to March 2022. Uh, the red line represents Montreal and the yellow line um, represents Ottawa. And surprisingly, uh, we can see that Toronto has the, the I guess, most amount of uh, job postings posted uh, for policy researchers. Um, so to answer your second question, uh, we can look at skills of a policy researcher by actually just clicking on uh, their occupational title when we search for them. So um, if I just go and click on work requirements here, oh, sorry about that. Uh, policy program researchers and, and uh, consultants and officers here, uh, we should be able to see what work requirements are in demand 
uh, for, for this particular occupation. So um, if we just want to look at tools and technology alone, um, we can see that the Microsoft Excel suite, um, like Excel, Office, PowerPoint, Word, were high, are kind of desirable, uh, as well as having some knowledge around structured query language. So uh, if we want to look at other skills, we can kind of scroll down and we can see that um, within each uh, view, they are ranked by their occurrence in each job posting. And so it kind of gives you a pretty good understanding of, of what skills or tools and technology you might need. Does that answer your question? Right. Yeah, it does. But let me let me do this one, which is a little bit more difficult. Okay. Let's say I'm a mid-career professional uh, in marketing and communications in British Columbia. I'm on an upward trajectory to a senior level uh, path, but I want to know what my options are because I'm going to be taking parental leave in the in the coming months. Okay, so. I'm interested in marketing, consulting, and event planning. I don't want to go back to school, but I would like to pivot with the skills and the experience I already have. Is there something in the dashboard that can help me with that? Well, that is a tricky uh, question, Anthony, but uh, while I'm not a career development practitioner myself, let's uh, assume you've given me some roles and ideas you might like. Um, and let's look at how, you know, marketing managers, professional occupations um, in, in, uh, in marketing, as well as event planners are doing in terms of demand. Um, so here I've looked, I look at, I'm looking at uh, using our comparison tools, the three occupations I've mentioned in British Columbia alone uh, over the last, uh, just over the last year or so. So as you can see, um, the professional occupations in marketing and public relations um, kind of has the most postings in British Columbia, followed by marketing managers and conferences and event planners. But like you said, um, you might need to know what kind of skills you might need, the experience to pivot uh, into a different role. So like we said, we can click on uh, professional occupations in marketing and public relations uh, and look at their work requirements. Um, by within each category or just um, kind of the most and how much they occur in job postings overall. Um, and uh, as you can see here, uh, we can see that uh, the Microsoft Office Suite is kind of the most desirable kind of tools and technology you might need, uh, as well as um, uh, something like Adobe Photoshop, as well as Google Analytics uh, and customer relationship management software. Um, so say uh, you had some time while you're taking Perlin, Parentally, you might be able to do something like a, a micro-credential or, or kind of a program boot camp that you can probably brush up or add to your skills in a short amount of time. All right. All right. Seems pretty good. Well, let's try this one. All right. Let's say I'm a mid-career professional. I have an MBA, but I've been unemployed uh, for the last two years. Okay. Uh, I'm a mature worker in my 50s, and I'm returning to school and retraining um, along the, let's say, traditional path is, is just not an option for me. Um, I took a, a package after many years of working in oil and gas, and this package included some outplacement services. In the past two years, um, and he's been, I've been unsuccessful to, to launch into uh, two businesses. And I've sent out hundreds of applications. Uh, and now money is, is, a, is an issue. Okay. Um, what, what can I do for this? Is there anything the job posting can help me with? That's another tough one. And I'm really sorry to hear about your hardships. And you can see you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. So let's try and work out uh, work with what you have, which is you know some experience in, in oil and gas management. So what I've done here is I've um, looked at managers and manufacturing utilities um, in the last uh, year or so uh, to see kind of where um, you know uh, managers and manufacturers and utilities uh, are being hired for the most. Um, and so I have 
our, our visualization here. And you can see that Ontario is the blue line, uh, British Columbia is the yellow line, and Alberta is the red line. So uh, although you're from Alberta, it looks as though the place to kind of find um, an occupation that's kind of very similar to the experience you have in the past would be Ontario. So um, if uh, relocating may be a possibility for you, this is probably the best uh, thing you can do. Now, um, your previous occupation in oil and gas management um, may no longer exist, or you feel like you might not be qualified, or you're not, you don't know what you're qualified for exactly. Um, so I just wanted to compare um, managers and natural resources and production, natural resources production like oil and gas, uh, to just manufacturing managers in general. And we can see that over the last uh, year or so, um, there's a lot more um, manager, manufacturing managers being hired uh, across Canada than there are managers in natural resources production. So you're probably better off looking for jobs in manufacturing and utilities than you are in natural resources production if you feel like that's a pivot you can make. Um, if, if this is uh, something you're interested in, you can just kind of um, click along through and look at different management type roles uh, and, and kind of compare across what you've done in the past to what, you're, what you want to do currently. That sounds good. And correct me if I'm not mistaken, but then I can also look at each of these occupations and view the different skills and other work requirements, right? To see if it makes sense and if I have some of the skills um, from my previous position, which might help me make that transition. Is that right? That is right. So um, if I just click on the work requirements uh, tab here, uh, I can see kind of what the uh, work requirements for a manager in natural resources and production and fishing maybe uh, would be, um, but you'd hopefully see some of the things that you already uh, are doing or have done uh, in your previous role. And you can actually, you can, you can see that it's actually compared um, to managers, uh, manufacturing managers. And what it looks like is actually these jobs in terms of the skills and, and work requirements um, posted in, in job postings across the country, they actually look to be quite similar. So things like you know, leadership, communication skills, budgeting, uh, and knowledge of the Occupational Health and Safety Act project management are kind of all very um, similar across both these roles in terms of job vacancies. All right. Well, it seems like you have some uh, some good uses of the dashboard so far. Uh, I've got two more questions for you. Let's see if uh, you can help me out with this dashboard tool of yours. So one thing that's uh, very important is this all this talk that I'm hearing of, of reskilling. Um, and actually, let's say that I am uh, I've had a successful career right as a quality engineer um, specializing in advanced manufacturing and aviation, for example, okay? Um, I've worked for Bombardier for over 20 years, but I feel uncertain about my future prospects outside of this company. And there's there's a lot of pressure on me for only having um, about 10 more years left of my career before my retirement planning. So I'm a bit worried about my current skills and new engineers are being uh, brought in, uh, with potentially higher technological skills or maybe knowledge of certain tools and technologies um, than, than I'm familiar with. So are there parallel options to consider? And is there anything that this dashboard can help me with in determining about upskilling and um, which skills and tools that I should invest in? That's another tough one, Anthony, Anthony, but I think um, I can try and help this. So since you said you were a quality engineer in, at Bombardier that specializes, as we said, in manufacturing and aviation, uh, I've actually pulled up um, some of the work requirements over the last uh, three three years um, uh, in, in manufacturing, uh, industrial manufacturing engineering, to have a kind of an overall look to see what you know, has been in vogue uh, over the past few years and also what you might need uh, moving forward. So if we're just really thinking about um, kind of tools and technology, we can click on the category and, and select what we want to see. So this is tools and tech. I'm looking at tools and technology here. 
um, over the last uh, three years for industrial manufacturing uh, engineers across Canada. So what it looks like here is that you know, Microsoft Office and Excel look to um, kind of be posted in, in a lot of job vacancies. Um, but things like having you knowing Autodesk um, AutoCAD, which is a computer assisted, uh, assisted design software, having knowledge about cloud computing, uh, Linux, as well as Python and Amazon Web Services might be something uh, that you know, job um, employers are looking for um, when hiring new candidates. So there's also a few things. So if we want to look at industry knowledge, we can see that having um, you know, a, a domains and lean manufacturing, um, as well as quality assurance uh, might be something uh, you should consider brushing up on or, or you know, really uh, kind of showing on your, uh, on your resume if you're looking to, to change employers. So in saying that, you know, what might be some parallel options for you? So let's see what I can do here. Like you said, you were a quality assurance engineer. So let's, uh, if I just clicked on the quality assurance um, uh, knowledge domain uh, in my work requirements, I'll, I'll click on that right now. And what we'll, it will pull up is um, the postings for, uh, or the occupations for job postings in this. So I, I wanna get dig down a little further. So I'm gonna look at um, kind of the most granular level of occupations uh, and see which, um, which occupations are uh, have are most or have quality assurance um, in their job postings the most. So what I see here uh, is I see that computer programmers, uh, information systems business analysts and consultants, as well as uh, information systems quality assurance analysts, uh, look to be kind of your top three picks if you really want to lean on your uh, experience in quality assurance. So if I click on something, let's say um, information uh, systems and quality assurance analysts, uh, I'll select that and what it will pull up is all the work requirements uh, that, that, that show up uh, among information systems uh, quality assurance analysts. Um, and so uh, as we're just waiting here, um, I can see that uh, it's just taking us a little bit of time. But uh, say you wanted to look at other jobs, you can always just go back, or other occupations, you can always just go back um, and um, kind of click through and see what work requirements they might have. But let's focus on information uh, systems and quality assurance analysts. So um, in terms of uh, overall um, kind of uh, work requirements, uh, we can see that quality assurance, uh, agile software development, um, knowledge and uh, project management uh, tools like Scrum, as well as understanding kind of things in the software development lifecycle might be really important skills as they show up uh, quite a bit or work requirements quite a bit uh, within job postings. Um, so if, if you're looking to make a bit of a pivot brushing up on some of these things or adding this um, to your toolbox would be really, I think, uh, a, a great benefit. Is, is that is that something, uh, is that make, does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, this is really cool. Um, it feels like you're kind of getting to know me uh, on a very professional and personal level. Um, let me try one more curveball, um, so to speak, at you. And, uh, you know, I feel like we're really getting getting somewhere. So let's say I'm a new Canadian. Okay, I'm a newcomer to Canada. Uh, I live in North Vancouver with my family. Uh, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in interactive arts and technology. And I really enjoy my freelance design work, but I'm kind of curious about working with uh, some sort of creative agency or firm. Uh, and I kind of want to know what job roles and titles um, that exist that may relate to my skills and kind of help me with that, that job search process. Uh, is there something that this dashboard could help me do with respect to that as well? Wow. Okay. So uh, saving the best one for last, I see. So let's try and work our way backwards um, in things you've already said. You said you've enjoyed design work uh, and you have a few years of experience in it. Uh, you said you have a very, uh, 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 you're very attentive to detail. Um, you use Adobe Photoshop and you're probably very likely to be a self, uh, self starter given your work in freelance design. So what I've done in the dashboard is that I actually searched um, the 
work requirement I'm, uh, I think you're very strong in, which is graphic design. Um, as you can see, it's just, it's, um, it shows up here and it has its own little icon to let you know that you're not looking up an occupation, you're actually looking up a work requirement. So I've limited my search to only uh, those, uh, only, I guess, job postings in uh, British Columbia. Uh, and I've looked at, uh, set my date range from March, 2019 to March, 2022. And uh, as you can see here, we actually have in BC uh, two options, um, two occupations that, uh, you know, put graphic design as one of the uh, work requirements that they have in their occupation. And that's professional occupations in advertising, marketing, and public relations, uh, and also graphic designers and illustrators. So uh, I'm going to start from the bottom here, and I want to see some of the other kind of work requirements uh, that might be um in demand for this particular occupation so i'll start with graphic designers and illustrators so i just click on them um, and i pull up um kind of the work requirements that that would be uh related to to the job postings here if i wanted to compare them directly i could add them in my comparisons tab or i could just search them individually um, it's totally up to you so uh, just bear with me uh, here for a minute. Um, but basically, uh, I just want to get an understanding of kind of what other skills um, would be for graphic designers. So OK, it's uh, pulled up now. Um, and what we can see kind of in the first 10 work requirements uh, for graphic designers and illustrators is uh, attention to detail, um, obviously graphic design, but having a strong um, Kind of skills in Adobe Photoshop, as well as being, uh, you know, a bit of a self-starter. So this looks like something that that might um, kind of resound with you um, quite quite well with with what you've already told me. But you know, what if we, you know, wanted to explore all our options? Um, what we can do is we can go back, um, or we can just type in um, professionals in advertising and marketing uh, in our search query. Uh, and we should get, sorry about that. We should get uh, the the occupation we were just looking at uh, before this. Apologies, bear with me here. Okay, um, I guess it doesn't want to play. So <laughs> let's just move on a second here. Um, so what if I want to know, you know how many um, jobs are actually um, uh, available or jobs are vacant in, uh, between graphic illustrators and um, kind of occupations in, in advertising, marketing, and public relations in general? So um, I've selected kind of the same um, date range uh, location uh, and just I use their comparison uh, feature to compare those uh, doing graphic design and illustration to this uh, general occupations in advertising, marketing, and public relations. And we can see um, that you know professionals in advertising, uh, marketing, public relations have a lot more vacancies than those in graphic design and illustrators. But if graphic design and illustration is something that uh, you find you know is, is a better fit for you. Maybe maybe it's it's uh, something you should look into more than than just occupations and advertising and marketing and public relations in general. Um, does that really answer some of the questions you might have surrounding um, what you just told me? Yeah, it does. I mean, it seems like the dashboard can really help me with a, a wide range of potential use cases and decisions that I have to make either as a job seeker or if I'm working with uh, even a career professional directly. So I appreciate all of your answers. Um, I do have one last question that sort of came up as you were typing in the search fields for your professional um, in occupations and advertising. Um, as I watch you typing in, is it the case that we have to, I have to enter in an occupation by the NOC title? Uh, or for example, do I, will it search something automatically? Do I need to know the correct titles um, to do a search? Uh, so the, the 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 dashboard itself uh, pulls, um, I guess, the the occupational title, 
by the related search term you're looking at. So if, if I typed in graphic, it would pull up all the titles um, that have graphic in it. So it, I would say that um, it's not smart enough to, to think about you know, related occupations, occupational titles that you are, are maybe searching for. You would have to kind of hit a happy medium and you know, you'd have to have one or two, one or two of the terms within the actual uh, search query itself. Does that make sense? It's well, so I mean, at least one or two of the words that would be in the official occupational classification title. So to use to, you know, to have some of that knowledge beforehand. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. All right, so um, let's uh, do a bit of a recap here. Um, uh, the dashboard is really what you make of it in terms of trying to understand um, what job vacancies and work requirements uh, are available across Canada. Um, so it basically allows you to select, uh, you know, what your date range is. We, you can go as very, you know, recent as you can or look at, you know, all of the data we have uh, available in our dashboard. You select your occupation or work requirements and then region of interest. Uh, then it allows you to kind of analyze the occupation or work requirements based on the criteria you've already selected. Uh, and if you so choose, you can compare across occupation, regions, dates, or work requirements of your interest. So that's about it from us. Um, thank you so much for listening to us. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the, the question feature uh, through this webinar platform. But other than that, uh, is there any more comments from you, Anthony? Yeah, so we have quite a few questions already sent over in the chat. So I'm going to start by going through those. And then uh, anybody else who wants to ask questions, please feel free to add to the list. So the first question that was asked is, will LMIC be offering a micro-credential in LMI for persons interested in wanting to go a little bit further in their understanding of LMI? And so the answer to that question is yes. Uh, LMIC has partnered with uh, the Canadian Career Development Foundation, CCDF, to uh, develop a four course independent micro credential. Uh, the current timeline for this is the courses should be live uh, in the fall uh, of this year. Um, and they will consist of four courses on a variety of topics related to LMI. And it'll also be aligned to the uh, competency uh, framework that CCDF has also um, put out. Um, another question that came up is, what is meant by proxy? So we talked a little bit about how job postings are proxies for job vacancies. And what we mean here is just that they represent a vacancy, but they're not actually a vacancy itself. So the easiest way maybe to understand this is to think about it in terms of like skills and education. So oftentimes, since we don't really have prior to online job posting data, great indicators or measures of skills we relied on education. And so the idea was that educational attainment, such as a bachelor's degree, was a proxy for actual skills. So it's sort of um, a way for us to get an idea for how many vacancies exist, but it's not a, um, a statistical official measure, uh, if that makes sense. Um, another question is about who our data partner is. So uh, MZ or Burning Glass, um, which now joined, uh, no, so our partner is Vicinity Jobs. They are a data analytics firm located in um, BC, in Vancouver, I believe. Um, and that's who uh, we work with to get access to the data. And we've also worked with them to refine their algorithms. So it's one of the reasons why we chose Vicinity is that they partnered with us and have allowed us to review their, their process, their algorithm, to vet the data, and have worked with them to align their algorithm to the official statistics that we collect in Canada. Uh, which NOC code is used in LMIC job trends? It's the NOC 2016 or NOC 2022, 2021. So right now it's the NOC 2016 codes that are currently used. Uh, and we'll turn it over to you, Graham, in terms of uh, updates potentially once we start having the NOC 21, uh, 2021 being used uh, officially. If that's part of the work stream. Yeah, so um, to answer that question, um, 
we have the NOC 2016, but uh, we've actually further detailed uh, them into the career handbook uh, from ESDC sub-occupation groups. Um, so that's why you might see kind of five digit five digit occupant, uh, occupations in our dashboard currently, but they're not the NOC 2021. Um, those, the NOC 2021 uh, list uh, has been made, but it's only to be started being used in the census. And we actually don't have an idea when um, we'll know what the kind of cross mapping is between 2021 and 2016. Um, but um, we believe it'll be sometime um, in the next year or two. Um, so to answer that question, we don't have a definite uh, a timeline on that, but we'll know it'll be after the census is released. Okay. Okay, great. Um, and see, another question that came in was potential uh, problem with the website. So um, I just pulled up our website, okay, on my side. I would suggest removing the www. So I think our official is, is https colon um, forward slash forward slash and then just lmic-cimt.ca uh, without the www. Um, so I would suggest trying that, and if you still have issues, um, feel free to, to send us a message. Um, next question, what sources are being used for the job postings? Are company posting boards when public being sourced, linked into? Yes. So uh, sources across Canada, both in French or English, are being used. Both public companies, uh, as well as job aggregator sites, so such as Indeed, Job Bank, for example, um, provincial sites, so WorkVC, for example, they have a pretty good site where they list their postings. All of those provincial territorial sites are being sourced. Um, companies, job aggregator, aggregator boards like LinkedIn, uh, Monster, Indeed, etc. LinkedIn does not allow for scraping of their site. So LinkedIn is not, I believe, um, very well used as a source for, uh, for the data. Um, but any of the other ones that are public and that allow for that type of data collection are being used. Uh, question around the visualization tool. When comparing job postings in areas, uh, using population to show which areas have most job postings per area, um, does the tool allow you to do that? And then Toronto would, of course, have more job postings, but does it when you consider the population? So is population considered uh, when visualizing visualizing the job postings? Uh, currently, it's not. Uh, we just show the raw number of job postings within each um, economic region. Um, that's that's something we've looked into, but we've decided, um, at least in our first iteration of the dashboard, to just look at the kind of nominal count of job postings within each region. Okay, that's a good point. And maybe one that I'll follow up with to say is that we're also exploring other statistical methods for identifying in demand, uh, rather than using the uh, just a pure raw count or frequency of postings as well as skills. So there's a few different techniques that we've explored, borrowing from machine language, uh, machine learning, excuse me, as well as from economic uh, research, uh, revealed comparative advantage, RCA. Uh, and these are ways that we can rank the postings with different types of metrics to account for, for some of those types of uh, issues. Population being one, but um, more so uh, issues where very frequently listed skills, such as communication that appear in every posting sort of um, need to be weighted a little bit less. So it's something that we're exploring how to do. And once we have potentially a way that um, we feel comfortable with, then that might also be reflected in the, in the, in the dashboard and its interface. Um, so, okay, got a great comment, which we'd love to hear. This is amazing. Um, can we try it with a social science major, uh, maybe like a psychologist, um, psychology grad, for example? So I'll turn it over to you to grab maybe to follow up, but my initial um, situation here would be to, my um, initial thought is that Right now, it works by occupation um, rather than by, let's say, degree field of study. We do have another dashboard that allows us to track wages or earnings over time by field of study. Um, but because there are so many different potential jobs 
that a person might go into with any one degree, um, that it just doesn't doesn't work that way right now. Um, but yeah, over to you, Graham, to maybe clarify or add anything to that that you might think of. Yeah, so I think uh, I can't really fully answer the question, but if if there is a um, an occupational title you're you're looking for specifically, um, that might you know, you know, if you go to social, you do social work at school, and then uh, you become a social psychologist or a social worker, that would probably be able to be searched and then uh, also kind of analyzed with what work, work requirements they might be have, they might have in their in their vacant for their job vacancies uh, at, at a given point in time. But no, we haven't linked um, actual educational or credentials to um, occupational titles yet. So like in the case of psychology, for example, like the occupation that one could look up would be psychologist, right? Either an industrial psychologist or clinical psychologist or something like this, but not just, let's say, graduated with a bachelor's degree in psychology, for example. Okay. Uh, another question about the similarity to own it in the U.S. So this tool does not provide occupational profiles. So, for example, if you think about ONET, they have their skills taxonomy, but they have a variety of other job descriptors as well, right? Work tasks, um, uh, there's many. <laughs> uh, so, we don't have those. The equivalent to ONET in Canada would be what's going to be coming out this fall. Um, it's called OASIS that ESDC is publishing. It's the uh, Occupation and Skills Information System. It'll be very similar to the look and feel of ONET but in the Canadian context, and essentially it replaces the uh, career handbook. So um, the career handbook occupations will be developed more fulsome, uh, more fully into career occupational profiles like ONET, and the different descriptors will have ratings. So similar to ONET, where you might have skills, for example, rated according to uh, importance and level, the OASIS profiles will also have that same type of um, same type of feature, but this is looking or expected to come out um, around September of this year. Uh, so we got a, a scenario that someone painted for us. So let's say you have a senior economist who's looking to become a chief economist or some a government uh, equivalent. What are potential pathways uh, to to make that transition? Is that something that the dashboard can help us to answer? So that's that's a really good question. That's a tough question. Uh, you know, I, I'd love to ask uh, you know some of the senior economists in in, in our uh, in our organization uh, some of those questions sometimes as well. Um, you know, I, I would I would say that this this dashboard may not be able to really tell a stepwise approach and what work requirements you might need for uh, kind of uh, the next promotion or the next uh, step in your career. Um, but if you would like to do that, uh, there's probably it's it's probably better to speak to you know someone within the occupation or that within that actual title itself. Um, so to answer the question, no, I I don't really think uh, the dashboard can do that currently. I think what's important to to keep in mind is that the occupations are still classified or coded to the national occupation classification system right so those knock codes so a senior economist very likely will be under the code of of economist so it'll be lumped together so there is still some aggregation happening from the individual job title level um, for the dashboard and part of the reason for that is to be able to tie this information later on to actual labor market uh, statistics, right? So for example, if we want to tie this information to wage data uh, and others, which I think is where we're trying to get to, this type of data is collected at the occupational level. It's not collected at the job title level, for example, right? So uh, as we built the dashboard and as we started, it was important for us to tie it to that system that exists currently and then bring in these other levels or layers of information um, as well. So right now that's the way it currently is, but um, hopefully as this grows and expands, um, more information and more details will be able to uh, add, be added to this. 
Um, okay, using the visualization tool, are you able to compare regions within a province with one province or territory as well? Uh, yeah, you are. Um, so uh, maybe I can go back and show you if you'd like, but uh, once you've selected a, a geographic region, so usually we start at the provincial level or the territorial level, you can select the economic regions within that uh, particular province or territory. Um, it's really quite simple. I, I mean, I guess I could show it, but uh, how many questions do we have left, Anthony? Uh, one, two, three, we'll say we have four more questions. Uh... No, we've got quite a few questions left. <laughs> okay, so you know what? Yeah, let's let's try to answer as many questions as we can for uh, kind of the end. Then um, but, uh, it's, it's actually quite simple to do. There's just two tabs, and you can select uh, the province and then the the sub region within that that province or territory. So another another um, listener had said that some of the use cases that we presented didn't ca doesn't capture one of the most common issues that career development professionals face which is around career uh, credential recognition. So, um, for example, uh, people who need to have their credentials who are foreign, uh, foreign trained, having their credentials recognized in Canada, one important thing for them to know is the types of jobs that would ladder them uh, to a job in Canada. So is there something that this tool can offer uh, in that question? Um, that's that's actually something that I, I can't really uh, uh, answer all, all that well uh, with the dashboard. Um, you know, we pull the work requirements um, and you know the tools and technology directly from um, the competencies and skills uh, taxonomy from ESTC. Um, but there's no really um, kind of official designation between whether whether there's a credential that. Is attached to those to that taxonomy, so um, that's I don't think that's something that we have uh, the capability to do unless I, I'm I'm not aware of it. Anthony. Yeah, I think the credential recognition problem is definitely one that's been um, raised in the past uh, with, by lots of people, right? Um, it's not one that we typically have uh, addressed or worked to address directly. The only type of credential, let's say requirements in the posting would come from the occupation profile from the NOC itself. So linking the online postings back to the NOC and then from the NOC um, structure, knowing what type of typical education is required in Canada would be probably the uh, the limit uh, that the dashboard could, could show you at this particular point in time. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to move through some of these quickly. We've got three minutes left and we still have quite a few. Uh, plans to link back to provincial and territorial employment and training programs. So uh, we would love to do that. That's still a major gap in the LMI ecosystem in Canada, which is an inventory or a listing of what training programs currently exist. I know that this is an area of priority. Uh, Future Skills Center um, has been working on this as well as LMIC. So I think as we continue to advance and to identify what these types of employment and training programs look like, where they're located, then yes, ideally we would be able to link to them from the um, from the postings dashboard. Um, does there are there physical requirements or abilities needed in the post in the dashboard? To the extent that they are listed in the job posting itself, if they're not listed in the job posting, then they wouldn't be captured in the um, work requirements in the dashboard either. Uh, and then feel free, Graham, too, to interrupt me if uh, you want to add on anything. The tool is free. So everything that we put out at LMIC is free and available to the public, uh, freely accessible. So just using the website um, from our main website, you can navigate to the page and start playing with it and, and using it. Just to add, you can download the data as you see it uh, in tabular view, um, which, which might be something you're interested in like someone had mentioned they wanted to have like you know a, job, a ratio of job postings to population in a particular area so you can do that just by by appending your own information yourself yeah uh and there's a few questions about the actual search function itself so this was a bit of, about what i asked you earlier um so keywords they have to match something that's already in the knock uh spelling matters as well it will 
uh, auto fill for you, but there has to be something there to match to uh, as you're looking. So we have about a minute left. I know there's still some unanswered questions. So what I'd like to do is invite anybody who still has questions to please feel free to reach out to um, myself or Graham with any questions that are outstanding, anything that we weren't able to answer or get to uh, in today's uh, webinar. Uh, and really, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to um, listen to us. We appreciate it and uh, hope this uh, adds some value to, uh, to your lives. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Graham. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, I agree. It was uh, awesome to see all those questions coming through. Uh, I can tell that uh, our audience were super interested by the, the, the tool you, uh, you present today. And, uh, and I really uh, uh, found your different case scenario example very uh, interesting to demonstrate how we can uh, understand employment trend by uh, analyzing uh, on, online job data. So thank you for your presentation. <laughs> Um, I also want to, uh, to take the opportunity to say a special thanks to our partner association, the Labor Market Information Council for Canada, for having uh, generously sponsored this uh, webinar series and, and for making it accessible at no cost to all of you. So we had a fantastic conversation on various topics throughout the series and we discovered excellent resources that uh, I will highly recommend you uh, revisit. So you can access them on the LMIC website, and we will also make sure to include them in our follow-up email with the recording of today's webinar. And at Tarek, we'll, we'll continue our spring season of webinar with two free webinar series starting soon. One's called Building a Bridge, how employers and CDPs can collaborate to address workforce needs in 2022 where we will hear from a fantastic group of panelists on May 10 and 12. And then a second series called Using Research for Evidence-Informed Career Development Practice, presented by Lolin Berdol on May 18, 25, and June 1st. So please visit our website at tarek.ca slash webinars for more information or to register. And don't forget to subscribe to our webinar news to stay informed of uh, new webinar opportunities. Uh, finally, another important news is that our CanAccess uh, 23 call for presenters is opening today. <laughs> so Tarek invites individuals uh, or organizations with an interest uh, in presenting in January 23 to submit a brief session at line for consideration before June 17. But for now, please don't forget to share your feedback and future learning needs with us in the survey that will pop up on your screen. But let me thank you uh, once again, Anthony and Graham, for this uh, fantastic presentation. And thank you, LMIC, for, for partnering with us. So we hope to see you all at another learning opportunity very soon. Have a good day.